Hey everybody, it's Lavender Town, and today I'm continuing my series where I take a look at how movie adaptations change book characters, and then I draw them as they were originally described. The topic of today is Howl's Moving Castle, which I consider to be an absolute masterpiece. It, alongside Princess Mononoke and Spirited Away, are my top three Miyazaki movies of all time. Um, but I'd never read the source material, the original book before, so I read the whole thing, I put a sticky note anywhere there was a description of a character, and now we can really look into the changes that were made for the movie adaptation. So let's start with Howl, since he is the title character. Um, the biggest differences I saw with Howl um, were not only in how he looks, but actually in how he acts, his whole personality. The best example of this is in the movie when we meet him for the first time. He's kind of saving uh, Sophie from an awkward scenario where some guys are hitting on her and making her really scared and uncomfortable. In the book, Howl is the one hitting on her and making her uncomfortable. Um, so the first time we meet him, this is how he's described. He was such a a dashing specimen too, with a bony, sophisticated face, really quite old, well into his twenties, and elaborate blonde hair. His sleeves trailed longer than any in the square, all scalloped edges and silver insets. So this first description actually tells us quite a lot, though the description of elaborate blonde hair really did cause me a lot of suffering. Um, personally, I don't know exactly what that means. I assume that means that it's styled in a way that looks um, somewhat complicated, um, and it actually encouraged me to give him more like curly hair just because I feel like elaborate really sort of alludes to um, a more complicated and detailed looking hairstyle which I feel like with perfectly pin straight hair like he has in the movie um, I don't know if that necessarily would count um, I also didn't know exactly what to do with his outfit so I scoured the rest of the book looking for what to attach those elaborate sleeves to I later found many descriptions of his suit as being a fantastical and um, silver and blue suit which he wears for about half of the book so that's how i drew him in this first image of him i also decided to put scallops on the edges of the like lapels of his suit i guess you would call it um and because it seems like this is a bit of an older style more fantastical world um i wanted to give him like tails on it i also thought i just made him look more noble and to make his costume look more elaborate this is the type of verbiage that you hear associated with his clothes a lot, so I wanted to try to do my best and honor that. On page 294 and 295, we get some more information on his clothes, as his assistant has accidentally enlarged his suit quite ridiculously. He was standing holding the door to the stairs open with an arm that was hidden entirely inside an immense blue and silver sleeve. His feet on the bottom stair were standing inside the top half of a gigantic blue and silver jacket. Howell's other arm did not come anywhere near the other huge sleeve. Sophie could see that arm in outline making bulging gestures under a vast frill of collar. So this informed me that the collar part might be a little bit more frilly. Um, this was really the most I was able to figure out. I also learned from the scene that the suit is made of a separate jacket and separate trousers, so um, I made a good guess on that. His face is repeatedly described as having a no noble sort of look to it, as well as being bony, long, and um, generally sort of a sharper face than perhaps the one we see in the anime. On page 115, his hair color gets changed, and on 123, Sophie states, Now that his hair was dry, she noticed guiltily it really was almost pink. So I also drew him in his pink-haired version, um, as well as wearing the other suit that he wears for most of the book, uh, which is a scarlet and gray suit. His eyes are described as glassy and like marbles, as well as being pale green, so um, that's another small difference in appearance between him and the movie where his eyes are blue. Movie Howell's hatred for war and general noble prince-like demeanor is completely absent in Book Howell, who is a slob, a philanderer, and generally a petulant child, not just in the tantrum scene which is in the movie, but throughout kind of the whole book. Next up is Sophie, our main character, and um, spoiler alert, but she gets turned into an old woman for most of the film, so that's how I'm going to draw her first. Um, so here is how she's described when this transformation first happens. The face in the mirror was quite calm because it was what she expected to see. It was the face of a gaunt old woman, withered and brownish, surrounded by wispy white hair. Her own eyes, yellow and watery, stared out at her, looking rather tragic. 
She also is wearing a gray dress and a gray shawl through essentially the entire book, whether she's young or old. And on page 37, she says that she wraps it around her head and shoulders just as old women did. Um, so that's how I'll draw her first. Uh, I have to extrapolate the length of her hair. It's not really described, but judging by the fact that she says she sees the face sort of surrounded in wisps of white hair, I assume that it's around her jaw length. Um, just because I feel like she'd describe it sort of like going down her shoulders or the way it's tied up. It doesn't seem to be tied up at any point. Um, and later in the story, when she turns young again, um, it's described as falling over her face um, in a way that suggests that she has not tied it. Um, so that's my guess as for the length of her hair. The main difference I see in the old woman design that Miyazaki did for the film and the old woman that is described in the book is primarily her weight. Um, she becomes a bit plump in the uh, movie adaptation and she even describes herself that way um, once she has turned old, but in the book she is repeatedly described as having skinny wrists, skinny waist, um, and the gauntness that she describes when she looks at her face also kind of leads me to believe that she's more of a like scrawny, emaciated looking old woman rather than the stockier, stronger looking build of the movie version. Um, other than that, she's generally just described as having like wrinkles. I would say that her face being brownish doesn't really come across in the anime as well. Um, so I tried to show that sort of like darkening that sometimes happens when people get older. And then as for the younger version, like I said, she's still in that gray dress through the whole first book. Um, and her hair color is different. In the movie, it is a brown color and it's quite long, um, but in the book, it's just described as being a red gold color or a reddish straw color. She even says it's almost kind of similar to the pinkish color that she accidentally dyes Howell's hair. Um, so that gave me a pretty good impression of what kind of color I was going for. Uh, her eye color is never described though. She makes such a big deal over the pale glassy eyes of Howell as well as the fact that her eyes look yellowish to her when she becomes old that I get the sense that it's probably some kind of light brown. Personality-wise, Sophie is less different um, between the book and the movie than Howl is but there still are quite a few differences. Sophie in general seems to be a bit put upon at the start, which is very similar in the book and the movie. Um, but in the book, there is a lot more made of her sort of relationship with her sisters and her mother. Um, and I feel like we just get her character developed a little more in the book um, because there's more time. The biggest difference is that Sophie is also magical in the book. She can literally speak things into being um, and she turns out to be a witch herself. Um, it's even alluded to that she might be the one who transformed herself old, essentially on accident. Next up is Calcifer. Now Calcifer um, kind of appears in both the book and the movie as potentially kind of a side character and it isn't revealed until later in the story how important he actually is. And Calcifer is a fire demon. Now I regret to inform you that um, <laughs> In the book, Calcifer, there's just no easy way around this. He kind of looks like the Joker. Um, the main reason for that is, um, unlike Calcifer in the movie, which has a very cute, um, very Ghibli sort of face superimposed on the fire, um, Calcifer in the book is a lot more multicolored and looks a lot more like a face sort of like made out of flames rather than a face hovering over the heat of a fire. When Sophie first sees him, she describes him like this. It would be a thin blue face, she murmured, very long and thin, with a thin blue nose, but those curly green flames on top are most definitely your hair. Suppose I didn't go until Howell gets back. Wizards can lift spells, I suppose. And those purple flames near the bottom make the mouth. You have savage teeth, my friend. You have two green tufts of flame for eyebrows. Cur curiously enough, the only orange flames in the fire were under the green eyebrow flames, just like eyes and they each had a little purple glint in the middle that Sophie could almost imagine was looking at her like the pupil of an eye. So that's a pretty fantastically detailed um, description, and it's also very different than our lumpy and cute round calcifer that we have in the movie. 
Plot and personality wise though, Calcifer is actually probably the most like honored character, he's the most similar um, between the two, uh, despite looking so different. He has that sort of almost childishness to him while also insisting that he's a scary fire demon. Uh, he tries to cut deals with Sophie, uh, he seems to actually have a soft spot for Howell even though he kind of pretends that he hates him, and generally yeah he's just very um, very similar in that way. Um, so I do feel like he carries over into the movie really really well from the book and I think if you read the book you'll probably just accidentally start picturing him um, the way you saw him in the movie if you watch that first. Because of the vivid description of Calcifer, he's a very popular um, character to put on the front of the book covers. Speaking of the book covers, wow, Howl is looking really different in each one of these and did not help a lot with my drawing. <laughs> That's my girl. I really do prefer almost all of the designs um, in the movie, but uh, Calcifer's most of all, even though I know it's a bit more of like a stereotypical Ghibli look. Uh, to him, I just think that the way that he animates with the flames and his face sort of dynamically changing in the way that like a, a fire actually does um, makes him such a wonderful character to watch animate. And I don't know if this original design would have looked as cool, um, but that's just my opinion. <laughs> Last but not least is Michael, or Markel as he's known in the movie. Um, Michael is uh, essentially a boy who lives with Howell and he's working as his assistant, kind of like an understudy, um, or well, like an apprentice, essentially learning magic from Howell. Uh, now in the movie, Michael is kind of like, a, I, I don't know exactly how old he's supposed to be, but he's definitely like a little kid. He's like a little baby essentially. Um, he puts on an old man costume uh, so that he can sort of man the door for Howl while Howl is away. Um, but in the book he is probably the most different looking uh, than any other character. Um, so on page 54 Sophie meets him and describes him like this. Michael did not look servile. He was a tall dark boy with a pleasant open sort of face and he was most respectably dressed. On page 137, Sophie asks him, How old are you, my child? And we learn that he turned 15 last May Day. He's also described as being a whole head taller than Sophie, which was kind of an issue for me figuring out the heights because he's also described later as hovering near the elbow of Howell. Um, so if that was all correct, Howell would be like, 16 feet tall. Um, so I actually assumed that Michael is similar in height to Howell, um, but uh, yeah, he's definitely a head taller than Sophie. So significant difference in sort of proportions of these characters um, because of the older age of Michael. Um, he is also extremely polite in the book. Like that is one of his main character features. Even when she's literally like breaking into um, the moving castle, he acts as kind of a host. He's extremely um, patient with Howell and he works really hard. In the movie, he's more of a sloppy little boy who sees Sophie more like a mother, um, whereas uh, he doesn't have necessarily so much of that like maternal um, attitude with Sophie in the book. He's a lot more like, they're, they're kind of like friends. Um, and as for his clothes, there's only one uh, part of the book where he's really described exactly what he's wearing beyond just nice clothes. Um, and he wears a purple or plum velvet suit. Um, this is when they're going to see the king. Um, so uh, that's what I drew him in here. Um, I tried to mimic sort of the cut and style of Howl's suit, but make it a a lot less um, <laughs> overboard and elaborate and crazy because it doesn't seem like Michael shares the same vanity that Howell is um, always described as uh, exhibiting. Now since this is the final character, I wanted to use this time to kind of discuss the other differences that I noticed in the book uh, that really changed the way that the movie and the book feel. Um, so as I mentioned before, uh, Howell doesn't have these sort of anti-war sentiments that he shows in the movie in the book, and that is largely because he's not really involved in any kind of war efforts. Rather than becoming a senile old woman in the middle of the story, in the book, the Witch of the Waste is the primary antagonist the whole way through, and she's basically trying to own Howl's heart. 
I won't spoil what goes down as I suspect many of you have seen the movie and not read the book, so if you do want to read it, I just encourage you to experience it as its own separate story because the differences are significant enough that if you want it to be like the movie, you will be disappointed. I hope you guys enjoyed watching me draw these characters based on their book descriptions. Um, one last time, I just want to say I love the movie and I do prefer it to the book, um, so none of these designs were supposed to be me fixing anything or saying that I know better than, I don't know, Miyazaki or whatever. Um, I know I probably don't need to say that, but uh, sometimes people misinterpret what I'm trying to do, so I wanted to say that one last time. Um, I also wanted to say I love Diana Wynne Jones, I love her writing, Year of the Griffin is one of the best fantasy books I've ever read, um, so definitely give her writing a chance as well, and I hope you enjoyed the video, and I'll see you in the next one. Thank you so much to my wonderful patrons, including Neurocherry, Sunshine, Weekly Meet, Kelly Halsey, Kubaroshi, Moon Milk, Alana the Artist, Rylan Parker, Rylan, Kadaria, Something Super, Deadly Nightshade Art, Maria Vasquez, Astral Fox Art, Middle Z, Alilia Lur, The Espressive Poker Face, Morrissey Axolotl, Chris Draws, Kai Kisser, Subaki, The Becky, Liliana Hammondtree, Yav Lavali, Angel File, Cutie Pie, Ruined Rain Crow, <laughs> Rainwater Pearls, Ice Cream Pal, Lion, Valeria Louie, Nora Cornielsen, Cola, Rachel Singh, Yaboya Steve, JJ Jade, and of course, Lipla Pupleth.